Thank you for that kind introduction, Holly. Hello and welcome. My name is Narani Nimpuno and I'm the Head of Global Engagement here at Lynx. And welcome to today's live webinar. Those of you attending it live, do feel free to use the chat function and the Q&A to make it more interactive and to put questions to Natalie. And I'll make sure they get captured and uh, put to the speaker. And welcome to all of you watching it on YouTube as well afterwards, of course. So the Lynx Distinguished Speaker Series is a series of talks gathered here at Lynx by experts in the industry who have deep knowledge and exp expertise and often a unique perspective on a particular subject. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, Natalie Treneman. Natalie is the Routing Security Program Manager at the RIP NCC. She's responsible for all routing security related matters, including RPKI and IRR. And to date, Natalie has over 20 years of experience in technical roles such as IP resource analyst, product manager, trainer, and ITV6 program manager. And she serves on the board of NLLOG, the Dutch Network Operators Group. She has held many roles at the RIPE NCC focusing on improving its services and activities. And without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Natalie, who will give the talk RPKI, securing the internet one hop at a time. So Natalie, the floor is yours. Excellent, okay. Um, yes, so for today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the current challenges are in RPKI, uh, what you can do about it, some plans for the future, uh, some underground tips from under the hood of what's going on in RPKI and how uh, you can contribute to that. But first, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page on what we're actually talking about when we talk about RPKI. So the first thing is um, many people think that RPKI stands for um, routing public key infrastructure because people think it has to do with routing. And of course it does, but RPKI actually stands for resource public key infrastructure. And that is because it ties IP addresses and AS numbers to public keys. And why this system came into place, one minute of history of RPKI, is because the traditional system of creating your root object uh, in a database um, wasn't as robust as it should. People forget to update that information or don't put that information there. There are around 40 different databases, not all of them mirror each other. So things become more and more difficult over the last 20 years um, to make sure that you knew who was the rightful holder of a prefix and where your traffic was flowing. So this is why 10 years ago, the Internet Engineering Task Force uh, invented RPKI as a means, just one means to make BGP a bit more secure. So that's where RPKI came from. And we saw in the last two years that RPKI got a huge traction. And why that is, is mostly because the information that operators have is getting less reliable in the old IRR, Internet Registry but also because IPv4 becomes more valuable um, since we are depleting more and more. So people need to protect their assets and that's, that's very important. So that's where we saw that RPKI was gaining a lot of traction. It follows the hierarchy of the registries. We mean with this that there are five trust anchors at the moment. Well, actually six, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. And those five trust anchors are based uh, with the uh, internet registries. So ARIN, BlackNIC, APNIC, EFRINIC, and RIPE-NCC. RPKI provides you with authorized statements from resource holders. So an authorized statement, you maybe have heard the term ROA before, Route Origin Authorization, uh, where you can state that your uh, AS number is authorized to announce this specific prefix with a digital signature. When people are talking, are you doing RPKI? 
they actually can mean two different things, which is a little bit confusing. Um, you can talk about the signing part of RPKI, where you provide the data, so the ROAS, you make statements, authorized statements, or you can do something with that information, those ROAS. And uh, that is called validating or route origin validation. And this is what operators do when they configure their routers uh, to make routing decisions based on the data that is provided. So two different things, uh, two different elements of RPKI. Uh, both are very important, but it is, yeah, when I'm to talking to people, if they are doing RPKI, uh, what I actually mean is, are you doing route origin validation? Are you actually validating the information in RPKI? So here is the certificate structure. Um, like I said, the certificate hierarchy follows the allocation hierarchy. So because the regional internet registries knows who the legitimate holder of a specific block is, uh, they can also issue uh, or let members issue their certificates. So get, give me a certificate as the rightful holder of a specific block. And having such a certificate is important because that is required to create your ROAS. So that's basically is the first step, get your digital certificate. It's just one click if you choose a hosted structure. I'll get to that in the next slide. And then with that, you can simply set up your routing statements. Those routing statements then get populated in a huge database called a repository. And that repository is used by validation software called validators or relying party software in the ITF. And then that is what operators use to make decisions. There are two flavors. Um, you can basically, if you're not too familiar with keys and key roles and the whole public key infrastructure, you can say, okay, I'll go for the easy way out. I let RIPE NCC in this particular example handle all those keys and the key rollovers, etc., and I just deal with maintaining and creating my ROAS. That's the simplest way um, and the most recommended way in case you're just having your IP addresses with one regional internet registry and you don't want to run your extra uh, infrastructure for RPKI, like your repository for those ROAS, because you have to do that then as well if you choose to uh, set up your own uh, certificate authority. If you want to do it yourself, it's nowadays not that difficult. Uh, we call this delegated RPKI because we delegate uh, all the work to you, <laughs> the operator. And basically you can download a piece of software that's called Krill, or you can build your own, up to you. Uh, but Krill is open source, you install it and you generate your own certificate authority, link it to RIPE NCC because it still follows the whole way up to the trust anchor and then run your own repository with your own ROAS. It's doable, it's not that difficult, but like I said, uh, there are some, um, you have to remember some things there because RPKI is considered more and more critical infrastructure so if you're running your own CA, you have to treat it responsible and uh, keep it live and in production. So what are the challenges? Now we're all up to speed on what RPKI is, which elements are in there. Well, we can say that 2020 was the year of RPKI. And if you want more information about a lot of statistics of how RPKI was adopted and how it grew in the last year, I gladly refer to the presentation from Suzanne Foy um, that she did a while ago, also here at Lynx. So I'm not going to show you a lot of graphs up and to the right, but we saw a huge uptake in route origin validation at transit providers and IXPs. And Lynx is also doing route origin validation for, on their route servers. We saw, because of this, that there was a big decrease of invalid RPKI BGP announcements. And an invalid RPKI BGP announcement, what we mean with that is that the routing 
um, table says something different than the statement of the operator holding that prefix. So maybe uh, the prefix, the ROA says, okay, this prefix should be originated from this AS number, while in BGP, you see it coming from a different AS number. We consider that an invalid RPKI BGP announcement. And those are dropped by more and more parties. We see also uh, a huge uptake in signing objects at other regional internet uh, registries. So at RIPE, we always did pretty well. Uh, around 47% of all IPv4 space at RIPE NCC is now signed, which is really good. But the other regions were lagging a little bit behind. And specifically in the APNIC region, we saw a huge rise uh, last year, also in LACNIC, uh, Latin America and in the US. Also, what was good news is that all routing vendors are in, on board since 2020. Um, most of them, Juniper and Cisco uh, and uh, even Arista. Was Arista last year? No, I think the year before. They were already on board, but as of 2020, also Mikrotik, which is used uh, in parts of the world, are now also uh, providing options to do route origin validation. So that's great. Also, thanks to this software called Krill, we so you see an increase in delegated RPKI. So more and more people are setting up their own certificate authority and their own repository with their ROAS, which is really great because that is Basically, one of the features of RPKI is that there is this whole chain of trust that you can set up yourself. But with huge growth come big uh, mistakes or outages. Um, and so I'm going to delve a little bit deeper in what happened there in that area, because we're not flawless and we had some mishaps there. So what happened? Um, it started in January already last year um, for RIPE NCC. It didn't start out too well. One of the things that we run into was that a full disk uh, on one of our servers was full and we didn't get a notification of that. Slightly stupid. But what happened was as a result, the certificate revocation list expired because no more data could be put on that disk. A certificate revocation list is a very important element in RPKI. You might not have heard much about it because it's silently running on the background. And it's a list of certificates that have been revoked before they got expired. For example, if a member uh, of the right NCC no longer holds these IP addresses uh, because they transferred them uh, or a member has been closed, we keep track of all that information on the certificate revocation list. So you know which certificates should be there and should not be there. This typically runs all happily in the background and you don't notice much of it, um, but it is an important element of RPKI. It went unnoticed on our side um, because first of all, we didn't get a, a message that the disk was full. And on the other side, we didn't get a notification that the CRL because of that expired. Um, so the validators didn't know if they could trust all the certificates still on their list. There were some validators that didn't notice this because they um, had quite loose validation as we call it. So they checked if the certificate was there, they checked if the ROAS were okay, but not the certificate revocation list. This sparked a huge discussion in the ITF about the unified stricter behavior of validation software. Um, what should validators allow and what shouldn't they allow? And how bad is an expired certificate revocation list? And that discussion went on for months um, because all the validation software, so the validators all have to agree on uh, and the operators what is meant in the different RFCs and how to implement that. 
So we're reaching the end of that discussion by now. And in the meantime, a lot of the validators uh, updated their software to make it more strict. On our side, uh, of course, we had to greatly improve our monitoring. That's one of the things we learned from that. And that's also a tip I have for you. If you run your own certificate authority, set up monitoring because you really want to know when things go south. And it goes normally with your network, but if you're doing RPI, you also want to set up monitoring on your validator to see if it's still alive, for example. Then in April, we were barely recovered from this. We set up the monitoring and then something even worse happened. And that was that we deleted a lot of the ROAS from our members. Well, actually not members in this case, they were ROAS from PI holders, provider independent space holders. And how that happened is um, in our PKI, we listen in, in the technical sense to what the registry software tells us. So the registry software is software that says, okay, under RIPE NCC, we have this block of IP addresses that's held by this holder and um, they're eligible for a certificate. So the registry software got an update, um, it restarted and our RPKI software queried the registry software while the registry software was not fully uh, there yet. So all the PA uh, provider aggregatable space was not impacted because that was there on the moment the RPKI software queried the information, but the PIs were not there uh, yet. And because of that, um, things got really interesting because our RPKI software thought, oh, so all these PI holders are gone. That's great. Let's clean up their ROAS uh, and their certificates. So this got uh, pretty bad. We found out, uh, but by then it already happened. And then you have to think really hard about what you're going to do because RIPE NC typically does not uh, interfere with what the routing statements of our members, which is a really good thing because we don't want to be there. But it was our mistake. And we decided that if we make such a big mistake, we have to revert it, we have to restore it. So we decided to restore all the deleted ROAS in the way that they were before this happened. Uh, we also informed all the PI holders individually that their ROA was gone for a few hours. And of course, one of the things we did after we put back all the ROAS was we added a lot of checks between the registry software and the RPKI software. So for example, a threshold that if a big block with a lot of ROAS transfers away from us to another region, for example, to Erin, that we get a manual check hey, is this really what's going on? Or if it, something like that. So a lot of checks have been added there for to have, to have that prevented. That was a huge wake up call for us. That's the last thing you want is to meddle with your members data. But then that wasn't the end. It got actually worse. Um, we also run into a situation where uh, our rsync repository was unable, unavailable for seven hours. rsync is one of the two methods to, for validators to get to all the ROAS. So we've got two flavors. We've got RRDP, Delta protocol, and we have rsync. And uh, luckily, most of the validator software today, they use RRDP but not everybody runs that, those validators. There is still one validator out there that uh, doesn't look at RDP, but on, only uses RSync. And then when a repository is not available for seven hours, that means that you have no idea of if, if the ROAS that were deleted are still there or not, or the ROAS that are created don't appear. Anyway, the reason why this happened was that there was one malfunctioning client uh, validator software that was querying our repository and it got hanging and it established many new connections. And then, uh, yeah, the rsync repository repeat, uh, reached the maximum capacity pool size. 
this was awful. Um, but the first thing we did was, uh, the first thing what we had to do was um, up the maximum capacity pool size for the number of clients. Another thing that sparked this was a discussion, should we still use our sync in RPKI? Uh, and there's a, now a draft in the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, that discusses to get away from rsync because one of the things that we know about rsync is that it's prone to DDoS attacks, for example. So we're slowly stepping away anyway uh, from rsync, but we're not there yet. And for now, we have decided to move the rsync repository to the cloud to make it less vulnerable for these kinds of, uh, in this case, it was nothing malicious, it was just a hanging client, but to prevent this from happening again. We were not the only RER that had all these issues under the hood. Um, in August 2020, Erin made a manifest encoding issue. And a manifest is like a CRL, certificate revocation list, also an important thing in RPKI. A manifest, see it as the same as on a cargo uh, shipment where you have a list of items that should be in that cargo, in that, in that shipment. Uh, and it's the same with RPKI. So on a manifest is which CA, which row has, uh, if the certificate verification list is there. So if you make a, an encoding issue in that, then some validators uh, were like, hey, there's something wrong or off with the manifest. Let's drop everything um, in the whole tree. Other validators were not there yet, so they haven't implemented the, the really strict uh, filtering. Uh, and then they just let that slip. Erin picked that up pretty quickly. And one of their solutions was to test the new software that they are deploying. For example, if they uh, change something in, in their uh, Trust Anchor software, to first test it amongst a broader set of additional uh, additional validator software, so a different variety. So not only Routinator, but also the RIPE-NC validator, uh, Ford, uh, Octo RPKI. Anyway, there's a list. So they they just increased their test bed to compare it to multiple validators. Because even today, uh, in 2021 January, we still don't have all the validators behaving at exactly the same way which is ultimately where we want to go. So that was not pretty, but um, mistakes are awful. But the thing is, you should learn from them. And so we did. But what can you do? Uh, for example, if uh, we, I really hope not, but if, you, if we start deleting things again, um, you can set up alerts in the LAF portal. If you use the hosted RPKI platform, please, please configure your alerts. Also, you will get notified if somebody else, a different AS number, starts originating your space, which is also something you would really like to know as soon as possible, because it's not the first thing you look for when you have a network outage. Um, a hijack is not the first on your list to check, we know from experience. So set up your alerts. Um, they go through email and don't necessarily use your, just your work email there because if your mail server is in the network that is being hijacked, then you don't receive the emails anymore. So that's why I also think it's a good idea to use uh, an email outside your network to get alerts. Set up those alerts. If you want help with that, uh, my email address is at the uh, on the last slide. I'm very happy to talk you through it. Then what else can you do? The max length is an attribute in Aroa that confuses people to the max, really, um, because we don't have it in route objects. And a max length defines uh, how much you want to de-aggregate your space in the announcement. So for example, if you have a slash 19 IPv4 space and you're only going to announce that as a slash 19 or originate it, then you set up a ROA with, for the slash 19 with a max length of a slash 19. 
because that's the only thing you're going to do. And then if somebody wants to announce a slash 24 out of your space, it will likely get dropped because the ROA says it should only be a slash 19. But the max length attribute confuses a lot of people. They, uh, they're not really sure what is meant there. So what we see here is an example I got from our validator where an AS is announcing, supposedly announcing slash 64s. But nobody is originating slash 64s, hopefully in the global routing table in IPv6. Um, and they are actually not doing that. So they have set up the ROAS for slash 64s. Um, but probably, and I looked this up, they are announcing a slash 48. So this is quite pointless um, and not very helpful at all. So make sure that your max length matches your intent when you create the ROA. Another thing that we see uh, is an invalid AS number. So you're originating your space from a different AS number than the information that you put in the ROA. This is not necessarily bad if you do this on purpose, for example, for DDoS mitigation. We see people doing this, setting up uh, a ROA for just in case, because if you're under a DDoS, then you already want to have the ROA there. Uh, so you can originate that more specific, typically a slash 24 or something, from a different AS number. So this is not necessarily bad if you do it intentional. But uh, yeah, it's not always intentional. Uh, and especially if you go to a new provider, a new upstream provider, make sure to first set up your new ROA. It will appear as invalid, it's fine. But then when you, after the move, remove your old ROA. So um, that the old ROA is not lingering there. And that's probably what we see in these examples. So keep them up to date. Then, I looked uh, at the week between Christmas and New Year's, which is typically a week that's quiet in BGP because many have a network freeze or a week off. So I thought, okay, how many weird things do we see happening? And I looked at the Twitter account from Cisco BGP stream and I found still a bit over 28. I didn't put all of them here. A uh, bit over 28 weird things. And then when I started looking a little bit deeper, they were not all that weird. So for example, the first three green tick boxes, uh, they have Prager IT there. Uh, that was definitely not hijacking. This was an example of uh, uh, somebody moving their space from provider A to provider B. So the ROAS were set up. So this, some, in some cases, things are just dodgy. And in some cases, there is an explanation for it, but you have to look a little bit deeper. One explanation I couldn't find was for the tick box in the middle of the slide uh, for pref uh, a prefix with AS3 and AS7. I looked at this prefix um, and there was a ROA for it, but it was neither for AS3 nor for AS7. So it looks like first it got hijacked by AS3, later by AS7. Neither should, well, was in the routing intent. Um, so definitely something interesting going on there. AS3 and AS7, I could not find any relationship between them, by the way, or with the holder of the slash 24. Another thing that's interesting for all of these cases here on this slide is that they're all slash 24s and in one case a slash 23. Most of them are mo uh, more specifics of what they normally originate. So that's a little indicator like, hey, something is off here. Then on the right of the slide, you see two cases um, for a Korean university where Hurricane Electric, as Susan explained earlier uh, from Hurricane Electric, have set up all their ROAS. So how could this happen? Uh, how could somebody else start originating a more specific slash 24 from Hurricane Electric? Because the upstream 
of the Korean university did not perform route origin validation. So they didn't catch it. The upstream provider didn't, wasn't aware that the Korean university was not authorized to originate the space. So while Hurricane Electric itself does route origin validation, some smaller ISPs don't. And I'll get to that later. And this is where things still get problematic, even if you have set up the ROAS, even if you're doing route origin validation yourself, because some others aren't. And the same goes for the last two incidents on this slide, uh, where an Iranian network started um, originating space from another Iranian network while they, they had a ROA in place. But the upstream provider from the, uh, I would, I wouldn't, it's hard to call it hijacking because I wasn't, I, you can't still can't be sure if this was malicious or not. But the upstream provider of the FCP network in Iran was not doing origin validation at this, at this point. So it went unnoticed. So that was a more eventful week than I thought it would be uh, after Christmas. But just so you know that there's all kinds of things that can happen. Still, configuring a ROA or setting a ROA up, uh, up helps, and it helps a lot. Because I said earlier, a lot of the exchange points and a lot of the transit providers now do filter. So at some point, it gets caught if something is going on, but maybe not instantly. Um, and this brings me to the most important point that I want to make here is that although the larger ones have set up origin validations, a lot of the small ISPs or smaller ISPs that have BGP customers haven't set up route origin validation. And now we can see that this is becoming problematic because sometimes there are two hops before it cuts to the big ones or to a peering uh, or to an exchange, and then it gets filtered. But yeah, RPKI is first hop security. Um, and it only helps really if your first upstream provider does route origin validation. This is why route origin validation is not the holy grail for all BGP mishaps. BGP is not a very forgiving protocol uh, in terms of security. So this is why we really need path validation. And this is what the ITF is working on at the moment. So what are the plans for the future of RPKI? Uh, starting off with ourselves. And I would also like to hear your future plans uh, for RPKI. If we have time after this session, I would love to hear it. What we're working on at RIPE NCC is, the first thing is resiliency. Uh, we will not, tolerate or deal well with more outages, of course. Um, so the first thing that we did, we spent a lot of time on last year is the uh, metrics and monitoring, useful monitoring. And that's sometimes quite hard. What should you keep an eye on and what is less important? So we had quite a steep learning curve with that. Um, we now use Prometheus with Gravana for visualizations as most of you do. And we also have a set up SMS alerting for engineers uh, on 24 seven duty. We also heard that the other regional internet registries are also slowly considering RPKI in their 24 seven duty. We have it already for a long time, for years, but this is something that not every regional internet registry currently has. So I hope this will improve there as well. Then, um, we are moving rsync to the cloud, as I said earlier, um, because, and we will use multiple regions and availability zones uh, to make sure that we have a very high availability at all times. RDP, the other one, is already in AWS. We don't run it in-house. Um, and we are going to scale that up as well. So. Um, that is, that is the plan to move more to the cloud. Uh, we know there are a lot of caveats there uh, with just going for AWS. Uh, and we are thinking hard on, on 
backup procedures. So what should we do in terms AWS goes down or there are geopolitical issues, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're keeping that all in mind uh, for our architecture. The second thing we're working really hard on is the security. Uh, um, we want to make sure that our PKI is as secure as it possibly can be. But one of the first things that we had to do was an RFC compliance audit because there are more than 20 RFCs out there uh, on our PKI. And we wanted to make sure that we interpreted those RFCs the way they should be and we implemented that. So we did that and um, yeah, we did pretty well, but there were some points for improvement that we're currently working on. That's mostly between the hardware security modules where all the keys are and uh, our own software. Then uh, I'm building an RPKI specific audit framework that takes into account uh, indeed the availability, but also the security. And we decided to flow that into a SOC 2 type 2. This is all audit speak, you can forget it immediately, but it is important to assure that what we're doing is the right way of doing it and that we have the controls uh, and check on that. My goal is full transparency about these audits, what we do. And that's why uh, I will publish a report on the RPKI compliance audit before the right meeting. And uh, when we have carried out the SOC 2 type 2, one of the good things about this is that you can publish a SOC 3 uh, audit report for the wider community. So you can learn from that as well. And then of course, every, every year or every other year, we have a penetration test. Uh, so that's on the schedule. And this time also a red team test where we're going to hire an external security company to social engineer their way into our RPKI system, see how far they get, if they even get anywhere. We're very curious to hear about that as well. And of course, I will report on that. It's just not us working on RPKI. The ITF, as I said, is also working on ways to get through full path validation. So uh, the, one of the drafts that's on the table and being discussed at the moment is the Autonomous System Provider Authorization, ASPA, where you can have in RPKI attributes that define who is your upstream provider and how a specific path should go. Uh, so that's being un under discussion. You see dot uh, dash four here. It will likely go through more revisions and more discussion uh, before it actually makes, makes it to an actual RFC. But uh, yeah, and all these discussions going on in the CIDR of secure inter-domain routing operations group. Right here. Another thing uh, that we're looking at is validation reconsidered. This has to do with overclaiming, with transfers, and how the validators behave. So this is spun out of the discussion on the behavior of validation software, the unified behavior. And we are now discussing on how to implement that. The last thing that the ITF, well, there's a whole list actually, but the last thing I want to mention here that the ITF is doing is looking at resource tagged at stations. Um, we call this in, uh, in other words, the any signer. What we have sometimes is, for example, Amazon has the product bring your own IP and they want to verify the rightful holder of those IP addresses for bring your own IP. At the moment, uh, that's quite hard. They want to have a statement, uh, a digitally signed statement that they are the rightful holder of that space. Um, also, the letters of authority uh, that you have when setting up a peering uh, agreement or something uh, or transit, then you can sign that as well in RPKI. So that's being under discussion. Another thing that I want to mention, I'm not sure how known it is here, um, is that we're going to deprecate the RIPE NCC validator. And if you're running the RIPE NCC validator, please make a plan to move to a different validator uh, before the 1st of July. Because we're phasing it out. Um, and on the 1st of July, we will archive it and stop any work on it, which is important to know because a validator is security software, of course. 
So the phase until last year was everything was normal. We do bug fixes, security fixes, uh, RPKI uh, uh, AS0 implementations from the other regions. So how to deal with resources from uh, APNIC, etc. Uh, we have, uh, of course, other RFC implementations, uh, etc. Now, in this phase where we are today, uh, we will still do uh, RFC implementations, should there anything suddenly pop up. So for example, if ESPA uh, suddenly gets adopted, I don't think so, but let's be surprised. Uh, then we will still try to implement it before the 28th of February. Um, so we will continue to work on that. In the meantime, I'm reaching out to all the validators that we can identify. So I got their IP addresses, tried to figure out an email address with that and send them an email saying, hey, you have to go somewhere else. The training material will be updated. So today we use Routinator and our validator. Routinator stays and we will replace our validator with port, which is another flavor, uh, another one. So we will update that. And we will also put a banner in uh, GitHub for uh, our validator software that notifies users, hey, don't do this, go somewhere else. And then the last phase is we will stop working on all the RFC stuff uh, and the policy implementations but because it is security software, we still will do bug fixes and security fixes. And on the 1st of July, we'll archive and sunset it. We will not remove it from GitHub because we still want uh, people, allow people to use it for research things or stuff like that, but not in production networks. Alternatively, there is a lot of good stuff out there that you could use. I mentioned Routinator already. I mentioned Ford already. Um, there is Cloudflare that has one that's called Octo RPKI. RPK, RPKI client for OpenBSD. Uh, one of our staff members is working in his spare time also on a validator with every lesson he learned over the last 10 years. It's called Prover. And uh, there's also a Ripster out there that you could use. I want to leave you with some insider's tips, um, some juicy tips that you can use to your advantage. The first one is it might take a few hours from the moment that you create your ROA for them to flush through all the systems and appear in all the validators in PGP. So please do be aware that it's not instant. Um, it takes around roughly half an hour, maximum one hour to go from uh, our platform to uh, the repository. And then the repository has to be fetched by the validators. And that also takes some time, sometimes another half an hour. Uh, and then it has to be populated in BGP as well. So it can take a few hours. Please be aware of that. So in case of emergencies, you have already set up your ROAS that you want to have. If you run your own certificate authority, so if you're running Krill, be aware that your repository is critical infrastructure. We often see that people use uh, their own CA as a hobby project. Um, but if you run a CA in a production network and your repository goes down, uh, that means that the validators can't access it anymore and that they have old information potentially in there. So your repository, that part is critical infrastructure that should always be online and monitor it and uh, check its health. Then the third one is make sure that you regularly update your validator software. It is security software. Uh, a lot of things are, as I mentioned earlier, under discussion in the ITF. The validator operators are all there. Um, and sometimes, for example, with the stricter behavior, we did a run that was a little bit too strict. Um, we had to undo that again, so make a new release. And so always make sure that you regularly update your validator uh, to make sure that everything goes smooth. And the last one is 
don't forget while we're doing RPKI that uh, maintaining your route objects and maintaining filters in BGP are still important. Um, not everybody is doing anything with RPKI yet. And uh, so we have to still rely to some extent on IRR and internet routing registry and your own filters. So do not accept anything from your customers that is not their prefix. It's very important. So how do you get started? Um, the first thing I want to point out is a document that is maintained by the community for the community. It's called Read the Docs. Um, it's a re really good uh, document, well maintained. Set up your ROAS, um, download a validator, not ours, <laughs> you have the list. And if you need any advice or you want to share your experience, uh, in RPKI, we see it as a really good thing for operators to share everything they did, what they run into. And there are countless, countless of, of articles on, on the internet, on other providers, how they did route origin validation, for example. Telia wrote a really good blog post. AWS wrote a really good blog post. Uh, but you can also find uh, emails on Nanoc and the Routing Working Group. So there's no silly questions. No, don't be afraid to ask for advice. That brings me to the end. And I'm happy to take any questions, Nurani. Thank you. Fantastic presentation, Natalie. Really interesting and a good overview as well. I see there are a few questions and if I get the chance, I'll ask a few as well at the end. So um, the very first one from Steve Crocker, so our PKI uses five or six trust anchors. DNSSEC uses one anchor. Can you comment on the way in which having multiple trust anchors is better or worse than one trust anchor? And perhaps there are ways in which it doesn't actually matter. Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, a couple of years ago, around four years ago, there was this huge discussion if RPKI should not have just one track trust anchor for, uh, because it sounds like it makes more sense. But then it was the question, who should run this one trust anchor? And the logic uh, choice would be IANA, which is the organization that gives out all the uh, IP addresses to the RARs. Um, so, but that run into a lot of politics um, because there are people that say, well, IANA is a US organization and uh, for geopolitics that might not be the handiest or the most politically correct. Um, and it's called a trust anchor. So it, it all stands or falls with the level of trust that the users have in the system. So that is why uh, the community actually said, the ITF said, no, let's make five trust anchors. Um, and because they hold their specific block of space, they know who their users are uh, and go for that. So that is the reason why we ended up with initially five trust anchors. Um, I can also go a little bit into why APDIC now has another one. And that is a technical reason because they sign, uh, their, their community decided that it was a good idea that all the unallocated space so all the space that is currently not with their members, but they received from IANA, uh, is, has an AS0 uh, ROA. An AS0 ROA means a statement where you say, with AS0 as the origin, this space should not be seen in the default free zone on the internet in BGP. Mm. Uh, and that is why APNIC said, okay, we want this to be optional for the validator software to use this data all these ROAs. So that's why they set up a separate trust anchor next to that uh, for the validators to use uh, voluntarily or not. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good, good answer as well, because it shows also the sort of the distributed uh, model of, of IP addresses, but also then this aspect of, of trust actually, of, uh, that it's important to trust um, whoever's yeah. maintaining this. Uh, and another good question from Neil O'Reilly. Is it possible to use third party ECAs for RPKI, such as uh, Let's Encrypt? Um, 
we haven't heard much from that yet. Uh, it's an interesting discussion and uh, I, I would love to hear some thoughts of the operator community on that in, um, uh, in, in the routing working group, for example. Uh, but at the moment, there has not been any discussion on that yet. No. Mm. Yeah. Right, a uh, uh, discussion perhaps for an upcoming yeah. right meeting then. Sounds good. Uh, and then another question from Steve Crocker. So why does RPKI use CRL, so cert certificate revocation lists instead of TTLs? Yeah, a certificate revocation list uh, is, uh, is a typical thing to use in the whole certificate authority structure. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was already mentioned in the first draft of RPKI uh, and agreed on that we would use certificate revocation lists as a means to verify which certificate was uh, was valid and which isn't. So yeah, mm -hmm. architectural decisions, I guess. Fair enough, okay. Uh, I will invite some more questions from uh, the audience, but in the meantime, I'll take the opportunity to throw in another one. It was great to see also the great uptake of, of uh, RPKI in 2020. And uh, what do you see as the biggest problem or the biggest challenge uh, today in RPKI? It's actually, it's two. Uh, I can't really pick, it, it's hard. Uh, the first one is that we have to consider that even today, around 70% of the routes in the global routing table aren't signed. They don't have a ROA, they, there's no information about them. So it's hard, very hard to make routing decisions based on information that you don't have. So that I would see as a big problem. Yeah. The second one is, and I, I said that earlier, many internet providers that have BGP customers are not doing route origin validation yet. Um, they have other priorities. You all know how it goes. We see the same a little bit with IPv6. Um, but this is, I want to stress, this is about security and security is, is, is very important. Uh, IPv6 is also very important, but this is security and securing also your customers uh, and also your responsibility. Uh, so I would really urge uh, C-level, CTOs, CEOs, to make time available for the network operators to let them do important security work. So that is the second one I'm, I'm quite concerned about. Mm. No, good points. Uh, we've had a few uh, good presentations as part of the Links Distinguished Speaker Series by Anne-Marie Ekman Lovinden, America Keo, both uh, security experts. Uh, um, and, and I think they've really uh, made the point of how important security is, both this shared uh, responsibility we have, but also actually the real impact on your organization. I think uh, that's also where, why RPKI is important because it will have actual um, impacts on, on your organization. But yep. then, so, so how many um, invalid BGP announcements are there currently approximately? How big of a, an issue is this? Yes, so there are today roughly around 4,000 uh, invalid BGP announcements. Uh, I'm counting both IPv6 and IPv4 on one file, as it should be. Um, but not all of them are completely unavailable, those networks, because some of them have set up more specific ROAs um so if we talk about unavailable networks because of uh invalid uh, bgp announcement then i would say around 600 at the time yeah okay yeah and that if okay. we talk in terms of traffic so it would be for example if, if google would be one of those 600 that would be dramatic uh, um, or microsoft or something uh, or uh, a big transit provider, but that's not the case. Uh, so we see uh, a very, very small percentage uh, of traffic that is actually being dropped, like very small percentage. And I believe AT&T did a great presentation last year at Nanoc, uh, where they disclosed some of their numbers of the amount of traffic that they lost. So that's useful to look up. Yeah. Okay, great. And I'll, I'll throw in a final question as well. Uh, so, so from what you can see, what are the biggest concerns or the worries? What are what are the obstacles uh, to 
ahead of us? What are the biggest concerns among operators um, in implementing uh, route or origin validation? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, I get that one a lot. So um, what will happen if I turn on route origin validation? Because I might drop my customers. Uh, and that's the worst thing you can do if, if you get money from your customers to announce their prefix or originate their prefix, then what will happen? Okay. And that is in, indeed a good concern um, because then if they would implement route origin validation and their customers have not set up their ROAS, um, properly, then they would get dropped uh, in case of a, a hijack or something like that, or the customer does something weird. Um, so that is why uh, a lot of providers do quite a bit of hand-holding with their customers in setting up their, those ROAS correctly. And um, uh, I want to highlight a document here that uh, Flavio Luciani wrote. Uh, he's quite well known in the uh, exchange community, contributor also to uh, EuroX, and he wrote a really good uh, manual for setting up ROAS uh, and setting up route origin validation. I'm going to put that in the chat. I think that's a very useful document there for hand holding your customers. Great, fantastic. And I see that he's also been promoting this, uh, yeah, this presentation. And he's he's also a, a very strong advocate for for our PKI. So, yeah. uh, really excellent document. I recommend it to everyone. Okay, great. Well, I think I'm I'm afraid that takes us up to the full hour. Uh, great um, questions from the audience, but of course a, a fantastic presentation, Natalie. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all of you who participated, uh, to all of you who asked questions live, but of course to any of you watching it live, uh, watching it on YouTube afterwards as well. Uh, please do keep an eye out on the Links website for upcoming presentations and tutorials. We have some really interesting presentations and talks coming up. Make sure to register for those now. And you'll be able to watch uh, some of the past talks as well on the Links YouTube channel. So with that, I'd like to again give a very special thank you to you, Natalie, for taking the time to share this great presentation. It's been a real pleasure listening to you. Thank you. For to having any me. of you who want to find out more, um, make sure to uh, go to the Rapid CC website. There's lots of great information there. And uh, thank you again, Natalie. Thanks for having me. So with that, be well, stay healthy and safe and take care and see you at the next upcoming virtual event. All the best and take care.